Okay, so this is the sixth lecture. We're going to talk about some inner products. Okay, so the notation is that F is denoted as the real or the complex field. Okay, so the definition is an, an inner product on a vector space V over F is a function that takes a pair of the vectors to a field element such that it is like it is non negative with itself and is equal to zero if and only if V is equal to zero. And it's linear in the first coordinate, and it's linear in the yeah it's linear in the first coordinate, and also when you flip it you get a conjugate. Okay. So here are some properties. So there it is. This, and it's also linear in the second coordinate, and is a conjugate linear in the second coordinate. Okay. So I just skip the proof because it's all linear algebra content. It's just some review. And we define a norm of v to be the square root of v with itself. So here's some proposition is that the norm is zero if and only if v is equal to zero. And norm is linear in the first coordinate. Okay? I mean I mean the norm of lambda v is the absolute value of the lambda times the norm of v. And here's some definition of orthogonal means that u v when they and then probably is equal to zero and we denote as u orthogonal or u is perpendicular to v. Okay, orthogonal means their inner product is equal to zero. And we have three properties. So first one is the Pythagorean theorem for for u intersect v. Okay, I mean for u v being perpendicular. And the second is the Cauchy Schwarz inequality, and the third is a triangle inequality. Okay, so here's our examples. It's the space over C. So L square Z is a set of all uh, sequences with index symmetric index. Well, this can be rearranged to, well, this can also be arranged into like a, like B0, B1, B2. It doesn't matter because Z is countable, right? So we can arrange in a natural number sequence. But anyways, we use the a symmetric way to represent it, okay? So set of all such sequences, such that it converges absolutely. Not even, it's like, it converges square absolutely, okay? And for B, we define their addition to be this, and lambda A to be this, okay? And we define the inner product as the sum of A n times the conjugate of B n. So we can know that the norm of A is really just this, okay? Well, we know that this converges, so we can just take a square root, which just gives you the norm, okay? And we have to verify it as a vector space. So we first verify it as closed under addition. For AB, for A, we can write AN as this. We know that for finite case, we have triangle inequality, and AN, the norm of AN is less than equal to the norm of A, right? Because norm of a right from negative n to n you're only finitely many of them and each term is not negative so when you're taking limit it must be like larger right larger or equal to so we have this and now we let n approaches infinity which gives it's less than equal to the square and you take square root on both sides which you get the result so from here Here we already know that it's in the space, right? And we take square root, we can get the triangle inequality. <laughs> and we verify its inner product. So AB is this. Well, we consider it a partial sum. It can be written like this, right? <laughs> and you can just split it and you take infinity, which gives that this also converges absolutely. Also, we note that if the norm is equal to zero, which means that this is equal to zero. This is equal to zero means that a n is equal to zero, which means that a should be the zero sequence. Okay. And we have the very we have one more uh, property is that the space is complete, which means that for any Cauchy sequence of elements in this space, which is a Cauchy sequence of sequences. Okay, so each sequences, such that we want to show that it converges. So under the norm, the norm 
converges to some element b here, okay? And the space. So every Cauchy sequence converges in the space. So this this is the completeness. So we given let's just start. So we given AK is Cauchy, which means that for any epsilon zero, there's an n such that for any m n, we can have this is less than epsilon, right? So this, well, we just write it out is equal to this. It's less than epsilon, so we square both sides. Now, from here, we note that um, the sum is less than epsilon squared, which means for any single term, right? For any single term, it should also be less than epsilon. So you, you just take square root. I mean, so we get this. Because it's infinite sum, its limit of the sum is already like, you know, it's already less than this, and each term is non negative, so each single term should also have this inequality. Well, with that being said, for each fixed j, we know that for each j fixed, right? So here we fix j. Well, we have that for any epsilon, there is an instance for m n greater than n, we have. This is less than epsilon. So we can fix j, we fix j, and this sequence is a Cauchy sequence, right? Those sequence is a Cauchy sequence. Well, there is a sequence of, in complex numbers, so they converges. So we just let each of them converge to some bj. Okay, so now we define b to be all those such sequences. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Well, okay, now let's just continue. Well, for kk prime greater than n, what we have is that first we have this. This is less than epsilon squared, right? Because okay, so kk prime greater than n is just there's still greater than n, so we have we have this inequality, right? Just k kk prime, right? Well, if its limit is less than this, and you're like a um, you are a increasing non decreasing sequence of partial sums. Which means that all its finite sums should also be less than epsilon squared, right? Right, less than epsilon squared. Well, for any kk prime greater than n, we have this. We have this inequality holds. And notice that this is a finite sum. So for finite sum, we can take limit of each term separately, right? We can just take k prime to limit separately, which each converges to bj. Okay, this converges to bj, right? Now, we have this, and again, like this limit should also be less than epsilon squared. Now, we just let this p go to infinity, right? Which is still, right? Because this is true, this is true for any p, right? <laughs> this, this, I mean, this inequality holds for any p, so we can just let p go to zero. I mean, goes to infinity, right? So, well, this is really just a norm of a k minus b, right? a k minus b, and the norm is less than epsilon. And since we have b is equal to this for k greater than equal to n, right? For k greater than equal to n, and we also have the norm is symmetric, right? You just observe this. You can you can just swap these two terms. It doesn't matter. Is symmetric, right? And also, ak the normal ak is finite because you're in the space. Right? You're in the space. So what we have is that we have triangle inequality, right? For large ak, for any k, we have this inequality. We may we just pick we could we just pick k equal to like n plus one. So we fix n plus one. So we have b is. Nor b is finite, which means that b is in the space. Right? B is in the space. Because we, like, if this is finite, we square it, it's less than some finite, square of finite, width, which means that you're in the space, right? You're in the space, right? So it is complete. It converges to some sequence. We have shown that it's converged, it converges to this sequence, right? Because we have this. For k, we have this, right? 
All right, it's complete. So we have another example. R to denote the set of all complex value integrable functions on our circle. And we define their addition, multiplication, and their inner product. So we define the inner product to be like this, the integral. Okay, so we know that the norm is this. Okay, so let's verify the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Notice that we have this for any real numbers, right? So we said a equal to this, b equal to this, lambda non negative, I mean non zero, positive. We get this is less than this. Okay. And and we integrate with respect to theta. And we got this. And we just substitute lambda equal to this and we're done. Okay? Okay, so for this, we're dividing by norm of f. So we have to be careful. And we notice that f is 0. The norm doesn't imply f to be 0. Because, for example, if f is this function on the circle, right? If it is 1 at x equals 0 and 0 otherwise, then your integral is still 0. But you're not a 0 function, right? Well, you're, the norm of your integral is still, like, still, it's still 0, right? <laughs> But you are not a zero function. You are not a zero function. Okay. So this is not really a inner product space. And also, R is not complete. For f data defined to be this. Well, f is not integral, but because f is unbounded, right? This gets unbounded. Well. If we define f n to be to be this one over n, and before that, after that, we just equal to f theta. And this is a Cauchy sequence. Why? Because if we calculate this, so without loss of generality, which is just m is greater than n, so this is equal to it, it can be expressed as this integral. Well, this is non negative, so wait. But we're taking squares, so it doesn't matter, right? taking squares so we can just take off the absolute value sign. Well, we can use this. Okay, so here this is like a formula of this integral. Which means then if you if you just sub in, right, you sub in use the fundamental theorem algebra, and you see that oh it's a Cauchy sequence. Okay. And F in converges to F. Because it is equal to this, well, this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay. So here's just some introduction to like inner product space and some exam. To, we have a list of two examples of the inner product space. So like, being complete or not, like is not that important. Just to let you guys, like, have a taste of what is, I mean, what is going on. Okay. So like, just let you guys taste that like uh, what are we doing like what what can we do with those operations right okay see you guys